Our wings work quite differently to bird wings. One of the major differences is how we change the angle of attack and camber. We usually either have our wings at just one rigid piece that we then pitch to different angles of attack, or we incorporate a trailing edge flap that we deflect downwards to produce more camber and hence produce a lift at low angle of attack. That latter way is akin to pitching the wing to a high angle of attack effectively. And our wings have been wildly successful, whether that's on airplanes, wind turbines, cars, and so on. But bird wings are very different. They don't have this trailing flap. They just instead flex their wings. In our terms, we say that that's morphing. And in picture four here, we see an airfoil that is doing just that. It's a NACA 24012 airfoil that flexes more and more. Each approach has some potential benefits. For example, with the morphing wing, you have a very continuous surface that shouldn't disturb the flow as much as if you had this trailing flap just jutting down. But on the other hand, with the trailing flap, you can incorporate a slot. But that is where effectively there is a gap between the trailing flap and the rest of the wing. That then allows higher momentum fluid to rush in and onto the top surface to re-energize the flow that is going over the trailing edge flap. Why you'd want to do that is because it will help the flow stay attached, which means that you can deflect the trailing edge flap even more and still maintain attached flow, or at least mostly attached flow, and hence more lift. But another suggested advantage of a morphing wing is that perhaps you could couple it to the fluid so that depending on what the fluid is doing, it can react, this wing can react and change shape to either reduce the flow separation or even just maintain a steady lift or drag depending on what you want. This final advantage is really interesting because that could then reduce cyclical loading on the wing, and that could then reduce fatigue and tear and wear, wear and tear. One example could be uh, on wind turbines, for example. Cyclical loading on their blades are a major concern and often leads to failure. That's one thing that they have to be designed for. So in this podcast, we'll be looking at how these morphing wings perform both in terms of forces produced in lift and drag, but also the flow around them. And to do that, we're going to be looking at this paper called aerodynamic analysis of variable camber morphing airfoils with substantial camber deflections. It's open access and you can find it in the link below and the DOI is at the end of the page here for those interested. So to see how these cambered airfoils perform, so these morphing wings, these authors used both PIV in a water channel and CFD, which is nice to see because we'll get the inherent validation as we can compare the CFD to the experiments, but also additional data from the CFD. So in terms of how the wing can flex, you can really choose where it will start from. If like, for example, it can start right from the leading edge of the entire thing canvas together, or it can go from the trailing edge or very close to it. And for a fair comparison to other airfoils, like one that would have a trailing edge flap, I'd imagine you want it to start flexing around the same chord location as where the flap starts. So for example, if the flap starts at 20% from the trailing edge, then you'd probably want to have the flexing starting from about there as well. In figure two, we see their base airfoil that they tested, which is a NACA 24012. And then at five different morphed geometries of the wing, so airfoil one to six, they're labeled. The first 25% of the cord was rigid so that it couldn't flex. That always remained the same among all these different airfoils. But then there are the rest of the 75% of the cord could flex. And in table one, we see the resulting angle of attack when the wing is morphed. And this is a key piece of information because without these numbers, it would be impossible to compare this airfoil with ones that weren't morphed because you wouldn't know what angle of attack to compare it to. I mean, if you had a regular airfoil at three degrees, what does that correspond to in terms of a morphed wing? So those angles of attack are very important here. And they range from 0 degrees to 32 degrees. And for me, the angle that I'm most interested in is probably about 7 degrees because this is an angle where a substantial lift should be produced and hence the airfoil should still be useful. 13 degrees is also interesting because now we're at around stool usually and it would be interesting to see how this morphed wing performs there. And even 19 degrees would be interesting too because it would be just past stool. And well, anyway, let's just throw the other angles in there too and say that they're interesting too. So we're interested in all of them. And the cord, as we'll note here, doesn't stay the same between airfoil 1 and airfoil 6, which might seem very odd at first. I mean, it's the exact same wing, so the cord should stay the same. But actually, no, because once we consider what the cord is, the definition of it, it now makes sense why the cord will change. And that is because... The cord is a straight line connecting the leading edge to the trailing edge of the wing. So if you start curving the wing, 
that line will become shorter because the leading edge and trailing edge become closer together. So the fact that the cord is reducing in length now makes a lot of sense here. So in terms of how much it shrinks, it over like 10% for F06, which is quite a bit. Now, one thing I don't quite understand is how they actually morphed these airfoils. So the authors say, and I have some pictures here as well, that they 3D printed the wings out of PLA. I don't quite understand that because PLA is very rigid and brittle. So I don't understand how they morphed the wing with this um, approach. Looking at figure four, um, looking at the level of bending of the wing is going through, even like airfoil two with PLA would be a challenge. Airfoil 3 would almost certainly break, as would all the others above that. Airfoil 2 might even break still, I don't know. So I don't understand how they flex the airfoil, unless what they mean is that each airfoil is simply in this geometry, and this is actually six different airfoils, not just one flexed to different amounts. So they printed each six in uh, PLA and can actually flex it. It's just uh, like a pretend flex, what would happen if you were to flex it to this um, geometry. Anyway, we have these six airfoils that they're testing. Now in figures six and seven, we see the POV set up in their water channel and it's pretty standard. One thing to note is that the laser sheet is shot, uh, slicing through the wing perpendicular to the cord. So we'll see that plane, like let's say you have the wing going forwards and you're looking from the side. That's pretty much the view that we're seeing it from. The Reynolds number is 21,900, which is not great. And the reason why I say that is because at such a low Reynolds number, there is more chance that the float will separate over the airfoil. So looking at figure four, um, even airfoil three stands a pretty good chance at this low Reynolds number for flow to separate over it. We'll have to see later on how it performed. Now for their CFD, they used OpaFoam, which is good. It's a top tier and free CFD software, which you don't hear very often. And if you're interested in learning it, then check out our courses here. Now they used RANS and the KAMIGA SST turbulence model which is good. That's a, a very good modern one. It works quite well. Now in figure six, uh, sorry, figure nine, we see the computational domain that they used and they seem to have used like a sliding mesh. They call it AMI, which is it stands for an arbitrary mesh interface. And you usually use something like this. So this little cylindrical bit in the middle, that's like the sliding mesh bit. But from what I can tell, they just used, used this AMI bit as a way of setting the region of refined cells and there wasn't actually any rotation going on from what I can tell. Now the domain is big. They, the authors say how various studies like from NASA say how large the domain should be, but they, with their domain here, it's like 30 cords in length and 20 cords high. And if they went to like the hundred cord length that NASA suggests or so, then they would add a lot more cells, which they deemed was unnecessary for their simulations here and probably they're probably right because if they're using rands then once you get to stalling the small effects of the bounding domain are not going to be that important compared to the inaccuracies with the stalling pattern so that's probably good a good trade-off here now in figure 11 we see their mesh and it looks good so figure 11 is just here there are a few different meshes the boundary layer mesh looks really nice. It gives a Y plus value below one. So the authors definitely tried to make this mesh very good and it seems like they did that overall. Just as a note, this is a 2D simulation. And even with 2D, <laughs> they're still using 3.4 million cells. That's quite a lot. Uh, they don't seem to have a mesh independence test here, but I imagine that this number of cells should be okay. In fact, it might be the case that a mesh independence study might've shown that using this many cells was too much anyway, so they could have reduced the number of cells. I don't know. We don't have that information, but I wouldn't be surprised if 3.4 million was even a little too much here. Anyway, that's their setup. Let's jump to their PIV results and their CFD results. So we are to compare the CFD to the PIV and validate it. So in figure 12, we see their baseline airfoil, airfoil one. So this is just the regular NACA 24012 airfoil, not cambered, not morphed. This is the basic one. The PIV is on the left and the CFD is on the right. The velocity distributions are shown and they seem to have the exact same color bar. I've, I've kind of looked at the um, labels and it seems like they correspond to the exact same colors. So that's quite good. So comparing the CFD to the PIV, they, it looks really good. In fact, I think there's actually more error in this PIV here than the CFD. And the reason why I say that is because 
if you look at the leading edge of the PIV, so the left picture, you can't see too much flow deceleration at the leading edge. So we know that as the flow hits the leading edge of the airfoil, we do get significant flow deceleration, but we don't see that too much here. So I think that the PIV isn't picking it up here and it might be because of the camera angle, I'm not too sure. The wake looks fine though, that's what we'd expect. So I think that the CFD is actually probably a little bit better here than the <laughs> PIV for this zero degree angle attack effectively. Now moving to figure 13, we now see the airfoil morphed to seven degrees, so airfoil two. And just remember that the CFD is rand. The PIV is an average over 500 frames, but that doesn't mean that it's the same as the rands because rands effectively won't pick up the unsteadiness very well. The major features will be okay, but even medium features won't um, come up. Anyway, the wakes look pretty similar. The CFD on the right shows this little wobble behind a trailing edge. We don't get that in the PIV, and that's probably because of that averaging case. If we weren't to average it, if we were just to take the instantaneous snapshots of PIV, I reckon you'd probably find some pictures that would be much more similar to what we see in the CFD. But anyway, the point at which the flow starts to separate over the airfoil is similar between the two. So this is good agreement. Now, one possible reason why there is maybe a slight difference in the um, point at which the flow separates between the two is the surface roughness. So it might be different between the experimental model and the CFD. The authors say that they treated the PLA, PLA wing, the 3D printed one, so to make it smoother, but that still doesn't mean that they're the same as the CFD. What's more, the thermostat intensity between the water channel and the CFD doesn't seem to be given, so perhaps the different thermostat intensities between the two are giving different results too. And that is even more important here than at high Reynolds numbers because at low Reynolds numbers like 21,900, small changes can affect the boundary layer development quite a lot. It can really accelerate transition to turbulence. And of course, we're not near that right now, but it's still going to be pushing it towards that much sooner. And actually the fact that we're getting flow separation is uh, because we are at such low Reynolds numbers. Even at seven degrees, the flow is struggling to stay attached. And that's just how important the Reynolds number is here. And hence how much of an impact the surface roughness and thermal intensity will have. And feeding back into the fact that they are doing RANS here, because we are getting flow separation, RANS won't give the same flow fields as the experiments. The inherent unsteadiness of the separation of the separated flow means that you're only going to get an approximation. Now in figure 14, we jump to F43, which is the equivalent of 13 degrees. Here I'm not I'm um, somewhat impressed because while we do still get quite a bit of flow separation, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. The CFD matches the PIV pretty well. The PIV averages give much better averages than the CFD, I think. Um, what the authors need to do is actually average the CFD results too, because even though they are RANDs, the unsteadiness does bleed through a little bit, not completely, but a little bit, and averaging that out would help a lot. And I think that if they were to average the CFD results too over, let's say, 100 um, time steps or uh, iterations for, for RANDs and compare that to the PIV, you'd get much more similar results. Now we see the same thing in figures 15, 16, and 17, which are when the airfoils are morphed even more. Now, personally, I think that above airfoil 3, so airfoil 4, 5, and 6, the RANDs results are almost certainly not accurate. And just from my experience and the actual theory of RANDs, once you start getting into deep stool like we get in these airfoils, the results become inaccurate. So I think airfoil three and below are fine. Um, that corresponds to 13 degrees and below. Above that, I think the results are going to be quite different. And we can see that the PIV doesn't really match too well a lot of the time. Anyway, as for the PIV, the flow separation on the rear top of the wing is about the same as you increase angle attack. It's just widespread separation. But if you look at the front of the leading edge, so let's look at figure 14 here and then compare that to figure 15 and then figure 16 at the leading edge, the flow becomes slower and slower as the wing morphs more. So this is an interesting point. What I think is actually happening is that a wake is forming here. And that's a little bit weird to say when you're at the leading edge, there aren't any streamlines to see, but it seems like the flow separates over the leading edge now. And honestly, I think that this morphing wing is one of a kind in that no other wing is morphed like this wing. Each morphing wing will have a slightly different geometry. So this stool pattern could be true. Um, airfoil stool patterns are different between different airfoils. So getting stool at the leading edge um, 
and then there being a slight reattachment before separating again could be a real phenomenon we don't have information on that with the streamlines um, or even perhaps raw piv images to get a general idea of the flow movement would be interesting but i think what's happening is a flow hits the leading edge and there's a stagnation point a little bit underneath as it wraps around it then separates and creates a wake at the leading edge on the top um, i think that's what's happening anyway the cfd for example in figure 17 as we come down here, fails to capture this separation around the leading edge. And I'm not surprised um, what is going on in the PIV seems very exotic and even a modern Thermos intensity, sorry, modern, modern Thermos model like the KMEGA SSD probably would struggle to keep up with that result. The underneath, so the pressure side, seems very good between the CFD and the PIV. We seem to get pretty good agreement among the higher angles of attack. It's just the um, top surface that is kind of letting everything down. So the CFD just seems to break down around the suction side, and that's because of the adverse pressure gradient, which terminus, tense, terminus models seem to really struggle with. Let's now move to table six, where we see the lift, drag, and pitching moment coefficients for each of these airfoils. Note that these numbers are for the CFD. So airfoils four to six, I think, should mostly be ignored. Airfoils one to three, I think, should still be okay from, for a general idea of what's going on. Now for airfoil one, the results seem fine. We get almost no lift, which is about what we should be getting. Um, the drag coefficient is about what it should be too. Now for airfoils 2 and 3, I actually think there's a typo in the drag coefficient. I think that th the values given here are actually 10 times greater than what they should be. It's just a factor of 10 off. I think there's a typo there. The reason I think that is because even for airfoils 4 to 6, we see drag coefficients over 1 and even up to like 2.6. Which is incredible i can't ever recall anything getting close to that if they were like a 0.26 or 0.3 that makes a lot more sense so i think that there is just a running factor of 10 off for air force 2 to 6. and if that's true then for air force 2 and 3 the lift to drag ratios are actually very impressive how the authors have written them they're currently at 3.9 and 2.2 respectively which is horrendous for a NACA 24012 at 7 degrees and 13 degrees and even at a random number of 22,000. <coughs> Um, I couldn't find data on this particular airfoil at this Reynolds number, but for a very similar airfoil, a NACA 23012, at 7 degrees and 13 degrees at a Reynolds number of 50,000, the lift to drag ratios we were seeing are around 20 or a little bit below. So what I think is really going on here is the drag coefficient should be 10 times lower than what's written here, which makes sense to me. The lift to drag ratios in that case should be around 39 and 22 respectively, and that is much more what I would expect given that these morphing wings should be more efficient, and that the higher airfoils seem to suggest that the drag coefficient is 10 times greater too. So the morphing wings should give us similar lift to drag ratios at least as a regular NACA 23012 airfoil without morph, uh, without morphing, but it could be higher. So I think that we are seeing better results here. And if that's the case, then um, these morphing wings are performing quite well. Leaving the drag coefficient aside, looking at the lift coefficients, they are also very high. Comparing them to the NACA 23012, we're getting like 20% higher values. And that makes sense because if you're curving the wing nicely, you're not introducing discontinuities like how wing flaps do it. Then the flow will behave better. And if you're not pitching the wings, that means that the top surface can perform better because you're not stressing the flow around the leading edge as much. So I think this idea of morphing the wings holds potential and we are seeing at the very least significant increases in the lift coefficient. And I also think that we're getting better lift to drag ratios. I think that's a typo, but even if that's not the case, the lift coefficient is better for these morphing wings. And this study suggests that at the very least, um, that's decent and perhaps more information should be um, researched into this. And with that, we come to this podcast. So if you like it, hit the me likey and subscribe buttons. And if you want to learn open foam, then check out our courses below. And if you're staying on YouTube, YouTube thinks you'll like this video. So check it out. Peace out, amigos.